Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today I want to talk about one of the most important charts I think a lot of people are overlooking and that's a world money supply as a lot of people have become really focused on what's going on in the US in terms of their tightening cycle and there's other places like Japan where there's some really interesting dynamics at the moment and the money print is coming back on. You know that's one of my main thesis for where things are going heading forward as well as everything else that's happening in these other countries. We're going to talk about all that today, um, tied together where things are heading in global markets as well as crypto markets. It's good to see crypto markets have had a pretty decent bounce since we did this last video talking about the timing of these cycles for Bitcoin and um, all altcoins really, really strong starts of the year. Uh, I guess I just also want to take the time to thank everyone that um, has supported, continue to watch the videos, uh, tens of thousands of you since I had some time off. Uh, it's been amazing and the hundreds of you that have signed back up um, for our premium research as well. So looking forward to a big 2023, uh, a couple of announcements to share on how content's going to be ramping up this year uh, shortly as well. So a lot of people have been focused on what's going on in the US in terms of their M2 money supply and how it has tapered off and even declined slightly after this rapid, rapid increase, particularly through the COVID years, after many, many years of steady increases. And we know the amount of money that's sloshing around the financial system, the more there is, the more that can go into stock markets, into housing markets, into speculative assets like crypto and whatnot when the money taps are turned on. So for the time being, central banks are talking tough, saying, hey, we're going to raise interest rates uh, and we're going to stop printing as much money or even reduce some of our central bank balance sheets and reduce the amount of money that's circulating through the system. Now, obviously, this is a huge problem for all countries, particularly those that borrow in US dollars where a lot of the trade is still being done, world reserve currency, as interest rates go up, there's now more repayments that need to be made, whether it's on your house or the money you've borrowed for business or whatever it is. And you're now trying to pay that back from a pool of money that's smaller and smaller. So this is where I've been talking about mathematically, we just can't keep raising interest rates or hold them there without completely crashing the economy. At the same time, we've got these other countries like China and Russia, resource-rich developing nations that are saying, hey, we're getting sick of giving you all our resources and being exploited just because you get to have the world reserve currency and print this money out of thin air. So the dynamics are changing around the globe with these countries that have um, pulled a lot of their population out of poverty into middle class. And now they're going to want to be consuming more goods themselves and having that higher standard of living. And the US isn't just going to get to, um, and the West, I guess, exploit the rest of the world for that cheap labor and cheap resources just by lending them that funny money. Countries are wising up to the fact that it's not working and it's getting them in a worse position. Uh, we've already seen El Salvador adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. And I think we're going to continue to see more and more countries go down that path as well. So those dynamics are changing. We've seen some of the Middle East countries talk about selling oil in non-US dollar terms. So it's a slow death that's coming for the US dollar. And that's particularly going to haunt them as they've got the highest national debt. But let's not forget that um, all these countries have got huge debts and can't sustain high interest rates. So as I said, Japan's a really interesting case at the moment where they've um, been on this path for decades and decades, low interest rates, heaps of money printing, and now they've finally got inflation at 40-year highs. And they're in that rock and hard place situation even more than other countries. So Bank of Japan had to announce more bond buying, even though like all central banks, their thesis has been talking tough. Hey, we're going to committed to fighting inflation, we're going to have to raise rates or things aren't going to be as easy as they used to be, times of changing. And sure enough, um, the bond market and smart money is buying that bluff. I'm going to talk about what happened in Australia as well and how that was a miserable failure. But sure enough, the Bank of Japan ends up buying more bonds as um, inflation starts to skyrocket, but they've got those interest rates, the yields on their bonds artificially suppressed still. So the only way to step in is print more money and try and keep those yields down. It's like pushing a balloon underwater and eventually it breaks and the currency breaks. So now I've now stepped in with this yield curve control policy um, as well as the QE, um, the different dates of the bonds along the yield curve that they're trying to buy to keep the interest rates artificially suppressed all the way along the yield curve. So back in December, they said they're going to buy 9 trillion worth of yen 
of these JGB bonds um, per month. And in a single day, they already had to buy 4.6, so you know, nearly or more than half that uh, quota in a, in a single day. Uh, this is the, the chart here where it really shows you how aggressively they've been having to buy these bonds. Now, in a whole week, end up doing $78 billion. The Japanese government bonds, already 50% of that market is owned by the central bank. So this is just how there's no real price discovery in these markets. And this is a huge market. This isn't just some fringe currency we're talking about. This is a really important financial player. Um, and a lot of the borrowing gets done. We're going to talk about this, the carry trade as well and how once you get these big differentials between major currencies, it really strains the financial system even more so. So up to $150 billion in the past three weeks, and this is what I've been talking about. The money printers are already back on in some way, shape, or form. They can have a different name for it, call it yield curve control instead of QE, and I'm sure, as they've done in the past, they might step in and start buying ETFs and mortgage-backed securities when the housing market starts to go down. And, and this is just all the uh, cracks that are appearing in the plumbing, and one by one, they're having to put these patches on, and the patches are printing more money, but saying, hey, we're not printing more money. We're committed to inflation. So heading it down a really interesting path. A uh, good chart here from Lynn Olden, and she's raising this point about uh, people are, a lot of people are focusing on how many bonds um, the central bank in Japan are buying, but they ignore that they've also reduced a lot of their other assets. So this is what central banks are talking about, saying, hey, our balance sheets, it's time to roll them off and, and decrease what we own. But a lot of that was actually defending the currency peg. So Japan owned $1.2 trillion of uh, US government bonds, but they've actually been a large seller and stepping into those foreign exchange markets, selling $240 billion, uh, you know, a quarter of their holdings to defend the currency because we've got such a big differential uh, in terms of those interest rates now. So let's talk about that a little bit more. So here we can see the Japanese 10-year uh, government bond yield in blue compared to the US. And so this gap really widens from say mid 2020 where investors can now go, hey, I can get 4% and maybe 5% in a bank savings account, whatever it is, a lot higher yield on the world reserve currency. And I've talked about this in other videos. So a lot of that money leaves, um, sells their local currency and goes and buys more dollars. And the other way to think about this in terms of a carry trade, so if you can borrow money in Japan at whatever their rate is, you know, 0% or when it was negative, you're getting paid to borrow money there to then go speculate on these other assets or go take it to the US and then you hedge your foreign exchange risk. And that's the, that's the carry trade that you hear people talk about. So from mid-2020, um, when that differential took off, just look how the uh, Japanese yen the exchange rate, the currency just weakens and weakens. And this is what we've seen in other countries um, to greater degrees once they run out of those government bonds. So we just spoke about how they own a lot of them and um, other countries can defend their currency and do these artificial pegs for some times. But, but once you run out of uh, US government bonds or US dollars or, or gold or you know the commodities in your economy can no longer sustain these pressures. That's that water under the balloon scenario or the flip side in terms of the currency um, where it just crashes. So same again, um, stock market sort of like all global stock markets really, trading sideways or declining slightly um, as the money taps have been turned off, but uh, I think they're about to come back on in a big way. And here we see the M2 money supply in Japan hasn't really declined as much as we saw in, in America. And this is the picture that I'm trying to paint for all these other countries around the world. You know, just forget what's happening in the US and I don't even think they're that committed to, to tightening. I think they're gonna turn the taps on eventually, but these other countries are gonna have to do it more so. So let's talk about what happened here in Australia a couple of years ago as they tried a similar thing, yield curve control. The RBA came out and said, we're going to target the three-year government bond um, so they can set interest rates currently uh, at the present time. And then you go at that yield curve for borrowing uh, longer and interest rates tend to go up the further out you go. So they said, we're going to target the three-year yield curve at 0.1% and we're not looking to raise rates um, anytime in the next couple of years. So this makes sense. And once again, it's almost like if you do the opposite of what these central banks have been saying, you would have made a fortune. So those uh, yields 
uh, absolutely skyrocketed. So this is the Aussie dollar. Uh, let's have a look at the three-year government bond. This is when they're doing their um, intervention. So here we go. This is um, when they were saying, yeah, we're targeting 0.1%. And then sure enough, the smart money uh, bond traders, they come in and say, wow, you're going to tell us that you think yields are going to stay down here and keep buying as many bonds off us as you at that price as you want. Well, this is a great deal. We don't believe you. And sure enough, the RBA spent millions and billions of dollars on printing that money and defending that that peg or trying to artificially suppress the yield curve, saying, no, no, inflation's not going up for the next couple of years. And then that balloon comes out from under the water and sure enough, the free market takes over to some degree and those traders make a fortune at the expense of the RBA um, and the Aussie dollar, the, the currency. Um, as you see from mid-2021, the Aussie dollar got hit. Now, like all um, countries, it's not that simple. Um, the Aussie dollar has actually held up okay in the economy because of commodities and those type of things. So it's obviously more complicated than that, but that's the, the general gist. The same with the stock market. Um, trading sideways, it's held up okay because of the record prices of commodities over recent years and the inflation, and we, we get that benefit of that. But think about these flow-on effects as I talked about before and in this video about the high interest rates on things like mortgages and businesses that have borrowed all this money and now there's less money floating around if central banks are talking about tightening and so the banks are less willing to lend because the central banks aren't giving the banks more money to do what they want with. So they're battening down the hatches and those people with mortgages or business loans, credit card debt, the rates are going higher and higher and higher and that's where we see the asset prices decline. So a house is only worth what a bank is willing to, to lend you. Very few people buy houses outright with, with the money that they have saved. And so that's what we're seeing with Australian economy so tightly tied up with the price of houses. I won't go into that in too much detail. You know, Martin and I talk about that in our, our monthly videos, but this is the, the flow on effects. And I just don't see how these global central banks can um, keep interest rates anywhere near what they're talking about with how high um, the debt is all around the world. So 300 trillion, let's use some round numbers here, of, of global debt. Let's say that interest rates around the world have to go to 5%. So you're talking $15 trillion a year just in debt payments to pay down the debt. You know, Global GDP of all the different countries, you just can't suck that much out of just to pay interest on the debt. And so that's why my thesis has been that these rate rises and, and reducing the money supply is going to absolutely slam the brakes on and cause different recessions and, and maybe worse if they go too long in these different countries before they are forced um, to turn the taps on. Now, that is either in the form of um, you know, dropping rates back down. But if inflation trends hot, we're in this situation where they might have to do all this artificial yield curve control and QE to try and push those bond yields down and the price of money down for borrowers to try and ease things and prevent this nasty crash while inflation is running hot. And as we saw in Japan and Australia, when you try and intervene, it comes at the um, expense of your currency. And they have to ramp up those money printers in the local countries um, to try and artificially keep things um, somewhat in check. So we could have a situation where there's global inflation, cost of living and food and everything going up, but we also have stocks going up, um, property prices going up, the banks are stepping in, central banks to buy mortgage-backed securities off the banks, they're printing money to buy more bonds off them, they're you know, giving them more reserves, encouraging them to land and, and, and this type of thing. So. It's a very interesting environment that we're going into at the moment with this um, game of trying to artificially suppress things. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, the US dominance and, and the rest of the world. We've just got such populous nations around the world now that have dragged a lot of citizens out of poverty uh, and into that sort of middle class status where they want to now consume goods. So the US and these Western countries that have benefited from having the world reserve currency and getting to print that funny money out of thin air and say, hey, thanks for the cheap labor. We want those those goods and or we want those commodities and those resources. I think all that is about to change and we're seeing that heat up in places like Russia where they have so much, 
many um, energy-based commodities and so on, but I think we're going to also see it in these other countries and just these developing nations that are resource-rich in things like rare earth metals and so on. This this game of saying, hey, here, here's some money or have some debt and, and give us the, the rare goods um, that we can't either produce ourselves at the same price um, or that we don't even have, okay? So that whole exploitation is going to swing in terms of power back to a lot of these other countries that have just got a lot of intelligent people that have gone through that cycle now and are looking um, to pros- you know, build prosperity in their own country or their own family and so on. So that's very interesting to see play and also protect their wealth. Now, in terms of protecting their wealth in all these countries, if the printers come back on, let's just have a think about um, the Bitcoin, how it's performed in, in other currencies. So let's take the Aussie dollar, for example. It was actually stronger than the US dollar a bit over a decade ago. So you could have bought Bitcoin for $2 US or $2 Australian at the same time. Now, Bitcoin in Aussie dollars is currently at 30000 because of that decline in the Aussie dollar price over time where Bitcoin price in US dollars, we know it's currently at 20,000. Uh, more of an extreme example is the Turkish lira. We know the Turkish currency, uh, Argentina, all these that have gone through pretty extreme devaluations, hyperinflation. You know, you could have bought Bitcoin back in 2011 so for say um, four lira, so only you know, double in terms of the US dollar price, four compared to two. But now, to have a look at the price, you know, we're sitting around 400,000 lira compared to 20,000. So that, you know, more of a tenfold return in terms of um, the wealth protection if those citizens that have had their wealth rather than sitting in the local currency. And this is what I think we're going to see more and more in, in other countries that over time, everyone's so obsessed with the Bitcoin US dollar chart and trading and price, but it just becomes more and more irrelevant as more and more countries are taking up uh, Bitcoin. And I really do think that we've seen El Salvador take the leap. A lot of those other countries have now had meetings about how to do so. And I think that's probably the next, you know, the next market cycle where we see multiple countries um, adopting Bitcoin as legal tender while we see death by a thousand cuts turning away from the US dollar in trade and pricing of commodities and, and so on. And a lot of these other countries have um, want to see more trade done in their own currencies or even they'd rather, you know, Russia would rather see trade done in Bitcoin um, than US dollars. So very interesting time to be alive. I think this is the most important chart that people need to understand and continue to look at. You know, the world supplies, those money printers has come back on not just the us m2 where yeah sure that's declined a little bit let's have a look at what's going on around the world guys if you want the extra research once again um, you can join nuggets crypto community send me a message down below or click on that group link to join and i'll send you a message you make sure you check your message requests it might be getting hidden in them um, if we're not friends on facebook but yeah you can go through all the topics um, hidden gems, macro updates, scaling, all the stuff we've been talking about for the past nine months. So, so yeah, big thanks to the hundreds of you that have um, already joined up. And it's great to see some of those projects that we've been covering for years and uh, continue to accumulate uh, with my updated portfolio in the recent bear market. Things like Rocket Pool we're posting about where it got down under $10 at one point, gets listed on Binance and jumps to over $40 yesterday, which is awesome. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, Hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, share these videos around, and I'll talk to you again soon. Cheers.